So thanks for being here, and thanks so much for participating. They've been really wonderful events, and everything we hoped they could be, in that um, we've found out about wonderful research taking place on campus that we would never have known about. And it's a great opportunity for us to be able to share that, um, especially through the, the TV station, TV channel. Um, uh, and we hope to continue to produce these fun presentations. So you can count on this happening next year. I think we have a couple people that are already signed up for the fall. So if you're thinking about it or you know of someone who might really love to do this, please let them know and, and let us know. So it's just my pleasure to welcome our speakers here this evening. And you have the information in front of you, so I'm, I'm not going to read it to you. I think, I think you can enjoy their bios on your own. But I am going to welcome them. So Dr. Sue Abdenauer, Professor and Holder of the Omer Professorship in the Department of Finance, Real Estate, and Decision Sciences. Is that correct? You're laughing. Did I get it right? It's fabulous. Uh, in the W. Frank Barton School of Business. Welcome. So Dr. Dabdenauer is going to, I'm going to say all their names, but you could, you, you, I know, it's like you just want to get this over with, don't you? Just get up here. So Dr. Abdenauer is going to present with Dr. Price, Dr. J. Price. Um, he's a professor in the history department and uh, an expert on local and community history, modern U.S. history, and public history. <laughs> it's true, right? We can say that. In the Fairmont College of Liberal Arts. And our second speaker is Mara Alejic. I, I didn't do it. Sorry, Mara Alejic, uh, professor and graduate coordinator um, in learning and instructional design in the College of Applied Studies, and so much more. Yeah. Uh, the third speaker this evening, Dr. Jared Mackin. He's a visiting uh, assistant professor of graphic design in the School of Art Design and Creative Industries in the College of Fine Arts, and also a fascinating person, and uh, just was telling him we're so pleased to have him here. And finally, and, and most delightfully, Dr. Kelly St. Pierre, who's the Associate Professor of Musicology in the School of Music in the College of Fine Arts. So welcome to all of you. And now is the moment where I bring up your title screen and you guys start the show. All right, uh, thank you for coming this afternoon. So we have a colleague that couldn't make it, Dr. Uh, Weems. Uh, he's also a business history distinguished professor. So wish me luck. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, everyone knows that Wichita is known for entrepreneurship, uh, mainly white entrepreneurship. Uh, especially uh, aviation, cattle and wheat, oil, the mental atom that you use. Uh, uh, most popular probably is the Pizza Hut that was started by Dan and Frank Carney. So examples of ethnic entrepreneurship, which we refer to as non-white, uh, is there is a lot, Lebanese, African-American, uh, we know that uh, Wichita has uh, grown in population, but not in the white sector, more in the Hispanic and Asian sector, according to the last census. The common themes and issues that we found were role of family and extended family in these ethnic and minority entrepreneurs. And uh, by the way, entrepreneurship is starting a business, and so that's what this is about. The target uh, uh, can be uh, suppliers uh, uh, and customers, so we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, uh, uh, 
the location is very important for ethnic entrepreneurship. It could be in their ethnic community or it could be outside their ethnic community. Um, getting money was uh, also an issue, mostly borrowed from family to start a business uh, and other unique things. Now, uh, the first project is the Lebanese entrepreneurs. This is a series of projects that Jay and I engaged in and Robert uh, recently. Um, so most Lebanese came after the World War uh, I from what was known as Syria. And so uh, after World War I, it was known as uh, Lebanon, the southwestern part of Syria. Uh, the very first uh, entrepreneur, you won't guess, it was the peddler, the guy or lady who carried things on their back and went around and sold things to people at homes. And so the peddler became a dry goods store, became a grocery store. And so that's how businesses evolved. Um, uh, now, uh, if you're uh, in Wichita also, you know that um, that picture you just saw was a diner uh, that was ready-made and was sold also uh, by the Ablas uh, for uh, people in the hotel supply. Many other examples of the Farha family, probably a lot of you have eaten at the uh, uh, olive tree where Jubana and Randa, Tobia were also known. My colleague, uh, Dr. Weems, uh, did a uh, collection history project in connection with special collections at WSU's Abla Library, uh, the Af Wichita African American Business History Project from 2011 to 2014, consisting of 32 audio interviews with transcripts donated to the facility in uh, 2017. Which over the years has been viewed as an environment that discourages rather than encourages black business development. Several individuals had to go outside of Wichita to grow their enterprises, and black entrepreneurs, especially those with commercial assets, had to find it difficult, if not impossible, to get business loans. The, uh, unlike larger cities with African American populations, blacks could not establish or maintain large enterprises. And because of over racial segregation that existed in Wichita during the early to mid 20th century, most historic black Af African American uh, enterprises catered to a black customer base especially coordinated around the Ninth and uh, Cleveland neighborhood. In recent decades, many black entrepreneurs have been able to reach out, however, with varying degrees of success to a non-African American clientele. African American enterprises provide personal services, though still primarily rely on black customers. The conversation resulted in a, con in a discussion about what to do to cultivate the next generation of entrepreneurs. The conversation on the Broadway project began with a discussion about businesses, particularly in the Latino and Asian populations along Broadway, uh, as embodied in the Nomar International Market created in the early 2000s. So it seemed like a good way to study ethnic entrepreneurship. We used a, a variety of techniques, including history, narrative, mapping, as well as data analysis using the NETS database from the Center for Economic Development and Business Research, the SEDBAR database that looked at a series of businesses up and down along Broadway. We in, entertained a number of, of specific questions. Mainly, we knew that there were two different ethnic entrepreneurship cultures, but did these cultures mix? Did one rise and replace, no, and replace the other? Did both expand? Was this really an ethnic neighborhood? Are these incubators for businesses? Are these established icons? Is there a rise and fall? These are questions we wanted to uh, understand. What we found was that Asian businesses in the center area and lower area peaked in the 1990s and then have since declined as Asian Americans moved to south, Southeast Wichita and so forth. Latino businesses grew in the um, 1990s and on, especially with the onset of a new migration from Mexico and Central America, very different from the uh, older Chicano uh, populations. More recently, we've been doing a survey project on recent uh, ethnic entrepreneurs consisting of Latino, African American, and Asian American uh, entrepreneurs. In the uh, Latino side, we had surveys done in both English and in Spanish. We met, uh, we went out to the uh, Chambers of Commerce. We went to the Wichita Asian Festival. We also had to go door to door. Um, part of this relied on community connections. I can only imagine what some of those businesses thought when a uh, you know, white uh, academic shows up wanting to know more about what their uh, family business story is like. 
So we found that they really need to do more research. The classic literature, such as Edna Benayich's um, Middleman Minority or Ethnic Entrepreneurship discussions on neighborhoods, doesn't capture the story here. We have to get a much larger conversation, and it's really a series of stories, not just one. And it's also storming as a springboard to new uh, research. Thank you. I will start by saying how excited I was when I saw the announcement in January about this opportunity to, in a quick way, talk about the research, but also this is my attempt to show you my playground, my sandbox. So just start thinking about two worldviews, mathematical and artistic one, and I push the button, and this is one uh, representation of that view. We have a dancer, but we can trace using computer-based um, techniques to see what a finger is showing or what the whole figure is showing. The uh, computer-based material is called the rotoscope. Going back to my idea of two different perspectives, I like to think about it as stepping back and looking into that from a third place. Um, so that's one of the ways I explore the research that I do in, uh, in this area. And this actually comes from anthropology research and it's a good inspiration for two uh, vantage points for me. One is my mathematics classroom in the, college, in the School of Education where I try to integrate math and arts with the purpose of um, culturally responsive context and attitude and motivation improvement. And the other one is Journal of Mathematics and the Arts, which I'll talk a bit more about. This, these are some of uh, my students' works that I use for my research. Important point here is just that we have to think about developmental levels of learning because I teach future elementary teachers. So, here are some works from my students. For this one, they are using software that's called GeoGebra. It combines algebra and geometry, and they are able to produce images like this, and definitely one of their favorite topics are things with stars and quilts motivation, and they relate that to cultures. Uh, this student used this intricate uh, model of a basket to produce something using the same software and to teach about circles and points and um, different components of circles. And uh, then this is mandalas, probably the top, one of the top topics that uh, they love. And I personally look carefully into um, concepts and processes that they introduce when they are working on this and also objects and processes in the construction of these pieces. These are a few quotes from my students. Uh, they recognize that integrating uh, arts in the math classroom is engaging and motivational. And as much as they think about it uh, for their future teaching, for me it's important to encourage them as future teachers to think about it. Uh, an interesting example how they view culture. We talk a lot about culturally responsive classrooms and they quickly, uh, some of them, introduce them based on their religion. So this girl was reflecting on her experiences. Uh, I love this example because it's thinking out of the box. A student used this mosaic to think about a game to use the game for students to practice numeration and operations. So these numbers are on cards and uh, they can move that around. Some other examples, uh, this one on the right is interesting because it was done when we were working on exponents and exponential growth. And the student said that she did have some help from someone in math department, like boyfriend or something like that, which was, Nice, um, and hands are always motivation. So, um, these are my research questions. I did not um, collect, I did not, I'm not sharing here too much about my findings because I just want you to really think what are the things that 
I had, I'm thinking about when doing this mathematics and arts research, I had to use, as I transition to something else here, I had to use this opportunity to mention Reza Sarhangi, who uh, is, got his PhD in mathematics department here at WSU, started a Bridges conference in Winfield, and the conference is going on for t more than 20 years uh, all over the world. Uh, you can see that this is an installation that students made in Finland, and it's published, here is a reference, in the Journal of Mathematics and the Arts, and I'm editor-in-chief for that journal. This is another installation from, this, um, from another group of students um, that I find interesting because it's part of the learning and part of their motivation to design things. I can take a breath, yes? Okay. Uh, moving, to, moving into something else, there is lots of digitally produced art and there is this ongoing question, what is really art and how we define it? Uh, Laura de Decker is an artist that has spent her sabbatical at the University of Waterloo in Canada to study quantum physics. Another example is this user emotion where 95% of people will see this picture as something that's moving and it's computer generated also, image inspired with by that Van Gogh's uh, Starry Nights image. And my main point here, raise your hand if you have seen this before. This painting is here, signed with this formula that you see at the top. It's really artificial intelligence product uh, using many algorithms. My question for me and for you is who is the artist here? Uh, it has been sold for half a million dollars at Christie's auction. And this is just my conclusion. Interdisciplinary work is amazing field to play with. On the left, it's a um, front page of the journal that was devoted to education that just came out. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Is that close enough? Is that a little bit better, maybe? Um, okay. Um, I'm an architect and a designer and a theorist who researches the intersection between architecture and the city. And uh, the two are so intertwined, uh, I feel like they can't be separated uh, as a research topic. And this image on the screen is, a, is just one of my projects that explores this relationship. My research produces cultural artifacts, and this is an image of those artifacts. It has different outputs, ranging from research to teaching to books to exhibitions, and then also what I call one-to-one -one models. Um, but all of these, um, all of these different artifacts then uh, span different mediums but then use specific architectural tools of representation as this image shows. It's an axon that also explains um, my research. Um, one example of these artifacts is my book, The Western Town, A Theory of Aggregation, which uh, studies the city through the fictional towns of Wild West movies instead of uh, real world locations. Um, but the book actually makes the argument that these fictional towns are real since they loom in our collective consciousness so strongly. And despite being fictions, I found these towns to be extremely productive as case studies. And I learned many different things, but one of the most important things I learned was how these towns form public spaces without any infrastructure or formal street systems, just architectural form. So these towns are famous around the world for their amazing streets where everything in the town happens. But if you look really closely, you realize that there's no pavement, there are no curves, there are no sidewalks. There's only individual expressions of architectural uh, form whose fronts all align together to make this street. So this is one of the most important parts of the Western town. I call it the stable typology. It's one of the, the base aggregate parts of the fictional Western town. It consists of a parent building 
with lean-tos, barns, fences, and then the most important part is the front porch, which also becomes a sidewalk. It becomes a private yet collective part of, of the town. And um, one of the things I also find fascinating is the way in which these movies project the present onto history. And um, the book then takes the history, or the fictions, I'm sorry, and renders them through so, so much detail that they become then real again, right? Um, and then this has kind of, per this idea has permeated all of my other work. So this is uh, another image of this book project, um, showing some of the models and the design used in that. Um, this is a mixed housing project for Marfa, Texas. Um, that actually uses that idea of how history or a fictional history can be a driver for architectural form. So the town is formed um, not necessarily through like data, but more through a fictional um, legend about strangers meeting in the desert and forming alliances and deciding to create the town um, as they become friends. Here are some of the characters within this uh, townscape. Uh, you can see that they all align along the fronts. They all have sidewalks or porches, but the backs are hyper eccentric. They uh, allow for the individual to be a part of this collective space. And then new social um, and cultural connections are made in these weird, strange backs. Um, a really important theme within architecture is the user or the inhabitant. And I'm interested in the antithetical user, the stranger on the far right. Um, and my next project um, that I'm going to show actually looks at this idea of the stranger in the city even more. Um, I think everyone can identify in some way with being a stranger in the city. I think that's a truism in the city. But I think everyone is also a little bit afraid of strangers. So uh, if we're honest about it. So I think what this project does is makes everyone a stranger. This is a diagram showing how it works. You enter into these 18 foot tall itinerant structures and you're face to face with another person. Maybe you know them, maybe you don't, but you have to start a conversation with them. Um, and these little windows that you see facing each other. Another really important um, typology that came out of the Western Town book was the outhouse. And um, I thought that the outhouse deserved a vacation, so I took it to Rotterdam, the modern city, the, the most modern city maybe in all of the world. Um, and these are some of the vacation photos. Here it is with one of my favorite architectural projects, um, the Kuntz Hall in Rotterdam. Here's a Sonnefeld house. You can see it peeking above the hedge. But the idea was to find out if the, the outhouse was as viable in the modern city as it is in these fictional um, Wild West towns. Here it is at a, a kind of famous hot dog stand. So like the employees pass through a giant Pepsi can to use the outhouse. And it also starts to become a critical structure within the city. It shows the deficiency of the plan of these buildings that it has to the outhouse has to exist in order for um, people to kind of be sustained in certain ways. Um, here's a horde of bicyclists kind of gathering around the, the outhouse and um, actually using it. I want to um, end, the or end the presentation today with an image of a model I produced for the, Ar the architecture Biennale in Rotterdam. Um, it shows architecture actually looking at itself through a substructural mirror. Um, the structures then cohere into a street only after becoming like a self-aware autonomous project, a quality which also allows my research to be both a part of context and contribute to context. So thank you very much. I am here because my name is indeed Dr. Kelly Sapier, and I am a musicologist, which is a profession that sounds like a punchline, and in some ways it is. It's the title of an album by Prince. It's also Barbara Streisand's job in the classic film, What's Up, Doc? 
during which she explains her research as recording the sounds of rocks. I do not record the sounds of rocks. I'll leave that to the composers. Ha, ha, right, okay. Instead, to be a musicologist is to be a music historian, like an art historian, but with a more pretentious and ridiculous sounding title. I'll also add that musicologists are not particularly useful. Who on earth needs yet another interpretation of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? And who could possibly care what Beethoven ate for breakfast the day he started composing it? And as my dentist recently reminded me, the facts are just the facts. How could anyone ever get a B in a music history course? All you have to do is memorize the information. It's not like it's going to change. And so my goal today is to share with you two things. First, a little bit about what musicology can do. Um, and second, the ways I hope my research might even be remotely useful, though I'm prepared to accept that it's not. I'm willing to risk, however, that you'll be on board by the time I finish explaining it. So the first thing to know about musicology is this. There's no such thing as Beethoven. It's true that there was a guy named Ludwig who lived in Vienna in the early 1800s and who wrote some cool music. But the rest of it, especially the idea that Beethoven was great, which of course is just an opinion that we express as a fact, is a product of propaganda. Beethoven happened to live exactly when and where a German nationalist movement took hold. At the time, German speakers were divided among 34 different countries, but Napoleon's marches across Europe inspired them to come together as a supposedly united Germany. This is the same nationalism that would later lead to World War I and II. But creating a supposedly united Germany required inventing a supposedly united cu culture and propagating and propagandizing the idea that culture, this culture was universal, beyond borders, and even timeless. As a nationalist composer himself, Beethoven's music had to become equally universal and timeless. Their propaganda campaigns were immensely successful. Today, the household composer names we have, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and even Haydn, Handel, Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, and Wagner, and I could go on. It's not that they wrote empirically great music, it's that they all happened to be German, and Germans got to decide what great music was. This is all just to say that musicology, despite my dentist's assertion, is not actually about the facts, but about interrogating the assumptions underpinning those facts and recognizing the power dynamics of who wrote history and who is left out. As one of my students recently put it, musicology is actually about the things you can't Google. And so now let me tell you a little bit about my research, which explores the roles of propaganda in shaping Czech music and its reception through the 19th and 20th centuries. And I'll admit that the Czech side of my research was absolutely just a happy accident. Uh, I am not Czech, though I've studied the language for 14 years now. Instead, I found my topic as an undergraduate violin player. This will make me sound much like a much better musician than I was. Uh, but I took some gigs around Europe and then <laughs> ended up spending two summers as an undergrad performing with Czech Philharmonic members during their off season and not in the nice places that they normally perform. Uh, but in any case, I was shocked by the history of the Czech Republic and especially music history. I learned, for example, that the exotic sounding Czechoslovakia of my imagination wasn't nearly so Eastern as I was raised to believe. In fact, the Czech Republic's capital, Prague, is further west than the supposed capital of Western music and culture in Vienna. In addition to recognizing my own assumptions as travel does for us, I came to learn that the founding father of the Czech Republic, it's George Washington, was actually a composer, not a military hero or lawyer. And the man who functioned as the head of propaganda under communism was not a career politician, he was a musicologist. That is, I chose to study Czech music because it was an instance in which musicology actually mattered. My first book is on the way Soviet propaganda harnessed that founding father composer named Beatrix Smetana for its political work. Citizens were forced to participate in Smetana festivals and scholars punished and sometimes even killed for the ways they treated the subject. And because I choose all the light topics, my newest book project concerns music and ethnic cleansing in Czechoslovakia. When it was founded in 1918, Czechoslovakia was a democracy, but the country had the unfortunate distinction of being occupied first by Nazis during World War II, and then almost immediately by the Soviets from 1948 to 89. This tragic past makes the Czech Republic an unfortunately remarkable case study for ethnic cleansing practices. As a country whose politicians were sometimes musicologists, 
Music research also played an exceptional role in formulating these policies. You might know, for example, how Nazi anthropologists and foreign policy makers under that administration, Czech musicologists acted similarly under both the communist and Nazi administrations. Under the Nazis, they used folk song as a measure of racial purity. Under communism, folk song collection became an excuse to measure individuals' ideological purity. But to lighten the mood <laughs> and to brag, so long as I have a captive audience, hello, uh, I was recently awarded a Fulbright grant to support my research. I'll be spending the next academic year in the Czech Republic teaching on musicology, on the musicology faculty of Prague's Charles University and researching for my second book at the Czech Academy of Sciences Ethnological Institute. The Ethnological Institute houses over 45,000 folk songs collected in the Czech Republic since 1905. Its ethnographers once imagined Czechoslovakia as home to 112 different ethno nations. To be clear, today's Czech Republic is only about the size of South Carolina. You would have had to have a new race around every riverbend. But my end game, however, is only that musicology doesn't always matter, but it does concern individuals' humanity, and so often has surprising and sometimes dangerous consequences. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wow, you guys are outstanding. Thank you so much. And as I was saying at the beginning of this, it's exactly what we had hoped for. So thank you for being here. Um, we'll take questions. I, I think any of the speakers will take questions if anyone has one. Uh, but we also have a reception set up for you where if you'd like to talk more about some things that were presented today, you, you can do it there. So um, does anyone have a... Yes, Brittany. Actually, oh. The, yeah, the, the question was, does Europe know what an outhouse is? Is that what it was? And my question was, does anyone know what the window on an outhouse is? And people answered, a crescent moon. But in Europe, it's a heart. And I had to convince the, the builder of the outhouse I didn't actually move it over there. Um, <laughs> that it needed to be a Western outhouse. But they do know what it is. And it's the same size. And it just has a different window. Get on the job. Thank you. Anyone else? Great. I'm coming right over. But I was just going to ask Jay Price if he could say a word about his project with Enrique Navarro. Sure. Um, the question of the, the project that I'm working on with Enrique Navarro, one of the spin-offs of the project, as uh, we're looking at the North End and the Latino community, and we're in the process of uh, doing some collecting of the uh, the families, especially of um, the 20s through the 70s, as that generation and series of generations try to understand what it means to be American, Mexican, and how they and how they navigate that. One of the things that's really come out of this research is the realization that the community of uh, Mexican Americans in the middle 20th century had a very, very different experience as opposed to recent immigrants, and those are two very different. Um, populations with different businesses, different practices, and so forth. So we're trying to unpack some of that. Great. Anyone else have a question? Okay. Oh, was that just a, that was just a gesture? Okay. All right, we don't, sorry. Um, just invite you all to join us just outside in the uh, walkway for uh, a little reception where we can talk more. Thank you.